It is Thursday afternoon. We are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 39. It is May 8th. And when we ended class last week, we had just a question raised about the scarlet cord or the red cord. We saw that in our chapter when we were studying the end of 38 and the birth of Zerah and Peretz, that we saw that the first hand that came out got a scarlet ribbon tied around the hand and the hand went back in the womb and Perez breached over his brother and was born first and thus comes into the birthright, comes into the line of Messiah. Not because he was first born, because we see God choose accordingly. Usually it's first born, but in Messiah's line are a number of instances where it isn't first born. But the question was raised if Zerah was not the one in the line of Messiah, why the red cord? Why wasn't the red cord on Perez? So why did it go this way? And I can tell you, I still don't know. <laughs> but I can give you what I think was probably about the best thought out of it, and then I'll give you a little other detail too. The idea was that the thread, the detail, was so that you understand what their names are and how they got named what they got named. It wasn't meant that this was here, look, this is the bloodline of Messiah. Um, and I think we have to realize that. Like when I've taught on third day in scripture, all of a sudden you're going to see third day examples jump out at you that are in relation to the third day being resurrection. You're going to say, wow, I see it here, I see it there. But I also have come across a couple of instances where that third day, at least to my knowledge at this point, has nothing to do with resurrection and with, with what we're seeing. So there again is where we just are careful that we not pull things out of context, leave them where they are, and realize sometimes we do see a greater picture and sometimes we just don't. So it does make a whole lot of sense that we wouldn't understand why one's called Zerah and one's called Peretz. Peretz meaning breach or breaking through, uh, and Zerah meaning um, rising, which you know is coming up like the sun's rising. We wouldn't know those meanings making any sense if we didn't have the story. So I think that's likely all we can draw from it. When we go into the Hebrew roots of the words, that's where it got really hard. And honestly, I, I went to source after source after source. Everybody got sidetracked and followed the same way and didn't deal with why the red, you know, why not. Um, so it was very difficult to find it. But in the sources that I could, this is the best that I got. But we have in Scripture the word Peretz meaning to break through spelled slightly differently, meaning to burst forth or breach, and even slightly differently to give us the proper name Peretz with a capital P. Now the problem is, back in the biblical script, there are no changes. Those little changes I told you we have are what we see in English, like a capital P versus a small p, or an E as a vowel instead of an A as a vowel. And in Hebrew, um, common Hebrew, uh, not common, um, up-to-date Hebrew, I can't think of the word I want. Mark. They put in the markings that tell us how to pronounce the words. So you see dots that tell you to pronounce it like an A or pronounce it like an E or a short E or a long E. We get that from the markings, but that's been added. The scrolls weren't written that way. So it took the, the Hebrew knowledge of them and being passed down for us to know which way it was. So even though I can give you, and by the way, those markings in Hebrew are called nikud, N-I-K-K-U-D, or you'll sometimes hear nikudot because that's the plural of it. So I can give you what we have been able to glean and learn since. But when I go right back into the scripture, looking at that, because we know it was talking about a son, I know that's the capital P. I know that's the Peretz that we should be using, and that's the one that means the, the breach. Okay, the, the breaking through, you know, that it was. But I could take you to Micha, to Micah, chapter 2, and in the Hebrew you'd see the same word as Genesis 38, and there it's not meaning a breach, it's a bursting. So it's just, you have to, again, go into your context and see it. And I could not find anything else that, that makes it different, but that it was to tell us 
that he basically jumped over his brother and came out first, <laughs> okay? Now, don't read into that more than you can. As I've said before, an infant that's not even a day old can't be thinking, oh, I want the birthright, I'm gonna get out first. They don't know what birthright is, you know, they don't have anything like that. They might be fighting as Jacob and Esau did in the same womb. We know that Rebecca went to the Lord and said, what's going on? You know, she must have had a terrible pregnancy carrying those kids as they were kicking and fighting with each other. I think all of you have been moms of one, so that's enough in there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we see some similarities, and it is interesting. Out of those two twins, the Jacob and Esau, and the Peretz and Zerah, we're going to see that they both had the younger try to thrust ahead of the elder. Yaakov, Jacob, didn't make it all the way. He's grasping the heel. But we see also um, that they both were associated with something red. Again, not necessarily red that leads the line of Messiah, because with Esau, there was red stew meat. And he also was called, as Rowena pointed out last time, he was called Esau because he was red. He, was, he came out ready, okay? So we see red there, and then we see the red string for Zerah. So, you know, here again is instances of red that's not meaning the, the Messianic bloodline. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, one of my Jewish sources did say, and I'll give it to you for what they're saying, that when we have the recording in Matthew, we have both, and that's the genealogy that leads to Messiah, we have both twins named, even though Perez is the only one that continues the line down. Zerah and Perez are both named. And that once again, for our Matthew writing to a Jewish audience, they know their genealogy, they know their past history, but do you think for a minute they remember it all? Mm -hmm. Of course not. But by drawing in some of these details, remember the red cord? Oh, okay, I know which twins you're talking about. They felt that it was that kind of a marker to help them remember. But I do find it interesting that even though only one twin carries to the bloodline, still both of them were named in Messiah's genealogy given to us in the Jewish book of Matthew. Just very interesting thoughts. Um, then I was also asked at the end of that class, do we know anything about Zerah's uh, genealogy? And yes, we do. In Yahshua, Joshua chapter 7, verses 16 to 18, it tells us that Zerah became the patriarch of the Zerahite clan of Israelites. So we know they went on as Israelites. In that, Zerah's great-grandson is Achan. Anyone remember Achan? Achan. A-C-H-A-N. Yep. Yep. you got good memories. Joshua 7 will give you your story. But he took spoil from Jericho, from Jericho. He, God commanded them not to take anything out. He took it, he hid it. God put the long light on him, and he lost his life over his disobedience. So, you know, and, and honestly, in all lines, we're going to find good characters, and we're going to find, do I say bad characters? I'll say characters who make bad choices. Okay? I so, that when God takes out one, he takes the whole family out, and their animals. That's often the way it was then, and when you know that you're dealing with clans and you're dealing with mindsets, and when God said wipe out a whole people, sometimes that was even mercy to the ones who would have lived in torturous conditions. It's, it's hard to understand. That's where God's ways are higher than ours. And when you remember he's not willing that any should perish, then you know, okay, there's a purpose behind this. Uh, for the little ones that lost their lives, they were guaranteed heaven. They, you know, God didn't give them a chance to grow up to the age of choosing. I believe he knows what their heart would have done anyway. Um, just before I do you, let me give one more, and then I'll get your question, okay? Um, also, the Zerites are named among the Israelites that returned to Jerusalem after the 70-year uh, captivity in Babylon. Get my words out. Okay, they returned with the tribe of Judah. It included the children of Zerah. There were 690 in number. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. 
At the same time, the parasites, so you got your Zerites and you've got your parasites, the two twins, they were chosen to live in Jerusalem. You read that in 1 Chronicles 9, verse 4. And they were called, and it depends on your version, anything from able men, that's New American, to courageous in our complete Jewish Bible, to go into the strongs, the word is chayil, and it means strength or efficient, could mean wealth, it could mean an army. So uh, the parasites had to been a good, strong, courageous fighting army group, if I put it all together. Nehemiah 11 verses 4 and 6 give us the parasites and tell us there were 468 of them at that time that were called these distinctive men, I'll put it that way. So we see God didn't overlook either line. We see God bring them down. We see that they continue on in the family of the Israelites. Where they are today, God knows. <laughs> okay, now question. Uh, how many years between... The, the grandfather and the grandson. Between Achan and Zerah, I'll have to pull up my Bible timeline, and I have a big one. If you can wait after class, I'll pull it out. It's table size and then some, and we'll look for the two of them in that. Um, Achan is Joshua's time, because Jericho was the first city that they battled and won, um, and then they went to defeat in Ai because of what Achan had done. So it's right at the time of, of Joshua. Um, Joshua taking them in is after the 40 years of captivity. So I can back up 40 years before that. But then how far do I get to when Joshua, to when the children of Israel came out of Egypt? We haven't even gone into Egypt yet. There's 400 years there. I'm going to say it's definitely 500 plus years between them. Okay, it's a long line before we get there. Uh -huh. So that's just trying to put together what I can think of quickly off the top of my head. But uh, knowing that the depth of that Bible timeline, I can probably get you something better afterward. And if you're curious, I'll put it on video next week. But I think that answers our questions. They, they were very good questions. Please don't be afraid to ask. We're not here to race through. We're here to learn what we can together from it. But I am excited to get us into chapter 39 because even though it's a hard chapter for our Bible character, Yosef, Joseph, we're going to see that he is a great example, probably the best example, if I can say that, at least one of the best, in our original covenant of showing Romans 8.28 in action, that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. But is that just a New Testament, a Baruch uh, doctrine? Or do we see that in the original? How about if we go to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20? Let's see what that says. 50? Chapter 50, 5, 0, and verse 20. So you'll get there fast. I'm having to get my tablet to cooperate with me, or me to cooperate with my tablet is more accurate. And Genesis 50... In verse 20, we read there, and I'm coming up to it. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. This is Yosef's famous words. This is when he is in rulership. He's talking to his brothers. They're feeling their guilt and the remorse over having sold him off. And he's telling them that he's not holding it against them. He, there's total forgiveness there. But more than just that, he's saying what you intended for evil, God intended for good. God had planned it, allowed it, worked it into his perfect plan to do what he's doing today, preserving the Jewish people. He had to preserve the Jewish people. One, he promised it. Two, it leads to Messiah. So with all of that in view, do we not see the principle of Romans 8, alive and well, in Yosef's time, recorded for us in chapter 50. And I could take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden, because we know that's just our God, who he is, and how he works. So, having said that, given us the backdrop, let's go into chapter 39, because when we left Yosef off, he had been pulled up out of that pit. He'd probably been crying for mercy from his brothers, who are selling him off now to the Midianites. Remember, the, the caravan was coming through. And they were going to go on down into Egypt, and obviously Joseph had no choice but to go. 
and that's where we pick up. We had the chapter in between 38 that was just like an interruption to Joseph's story. So verse 1, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. So you were picking right up where we had dropped off. What happened to him in Egypt? He's been sold. He's got no say. He's got no control. And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites. Remember the Ishmaelites and the Midianites both were interwoven, so they, the Ishmaelite was common named for the two groups, but they could have been Midianite or Ish, um, uh, what I just say, Ishmaelite. Um, they were cousins, so in the family. Okay, so he'd been taken down or was brought down, and we're going to see that this is just a part. In fact, sneak preview, even though it comes later in our scripture, go with me to Psalm 105, because we're going to see that God recorded in Psalm 105 what happened to Joseph also. Uh, this is where the psalmist picks it up in chapter 105 of Tehillim of Psalm, starting with verse 16, we read, And he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. Okay, that tells you he's going to be imprisoned. He himself was laid in irons. Again, he's a, he's a captive in a prison setting. Until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. We'll, we can talk about that later too. We will, but the testing would have been, Joseph had been promised from his dreams from God that he was going to be in rulership position. He's not only not ruler, he's not just neutral, he's in the prison. Wow, God, you know, did you, did you, are you going to do what you said? The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all his possessions. Yes, God meant what he said. He goes from the pit to the palace. He goes into possession. He goes into rulership. And verse 22, to imprison his princes at will. He now can put in prison who he wants that he might teach his elders wisdom, that they might learn from what they had done. Does he do that? No, he does not put his brothers into prison, but he had the right. He certainly could have, and they couldn't have said a word. So if he was one of these that will tit for tat, they did it to me, I'll do it to them. And for all those who say, well, karma, what goes wrong comes around, hello, that is so disgraceful to the Lord. That's not who he is or how he works, but we see that... God put in Yosef a forgiving heart. He put in him the heart he has, and Yosef extends that to his brothers. And as we go through it, we'll see a lot more that we'll learn from that also. But we'll go back now to chapter 39. We got our sneak preview. Spoiler alert, I ruined the end of the story for you if you don't like to know, but I think most of you know it anyway. So who has taken him now? Who's bought him, I should say more accurately? Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Okay, in the Hebrew, it does say a eunuch, or it could be a chamberlain. The root comes from the word meaning to castrate. And this is often what was done to the men who were in the king's service. Those who were close and in great areas of responsibility often were castrated. And the purpose behind it was that they, they would have one mind for their king. They wouldn't be sidetracked with the women and desires like that. They'd have full-hearted devotion. You might even have a wife. <laughs> There's a, the two ways to answer your question. It's a good question. I was asked then, why did he have a wife? One, we don't know if he came into this position afterward, mm -hmm. if he was not castrated before he married, or number two, did he go into that position, he's in that position, she marries him for position, for, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'll be mm -hmm. in that sphere of influence, I'll have all kinds of special uh, uh, but so we're not rewards, but you know, uh, I'll have those riches and those, goodies. you know, goodies, <laughs> goodies. There's another word for it, but we'll use goodies. But didn't they, I mean, not Potiphar gave the daughter when he made him chief of the whole thing. Because it, somewhere up here it says he made him, you know. Makes Joseph chief? Yes, and, and Mary. Mm -hmm. Gave the, his Joseph gets family. married, yes. So and Joseph has children. So obviously Joseph did not. Yeah, we're just saying, wasn't it Potiphar's daughter? So. Oh. So 
I I'll have to go read. I can't remember. I, I do. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Remember your question because that's a good question. But if so, that would tell us that Potiphar was not always castrated, that when he was in a marriage relationship, he did have children. So that would answer that question of which order it came in. But uh, um, it, it honestly kept there from being military coup also because that they were just more dedicated and genteel, I'll put it that way. So he is a, either a eunuch or a chamberlain. And by the way, because they were all called that and it wasn't done to everyone, we can't know, you know, we, we, unless we do. If we find out it was Potiphar's daughter, um, I'm not sure it was. I think it was Pharaoh's daughter. That's why I'm holding back. But I really think it was Pharaoh's daughter um, that married Yosef. I know it was Egyptian. That's all I remember. But Potiphar's wife, the one that went after him. Yes, and that might be why she went after him. You're all getting. You're cheating. You're taking shortcuts. <laughs> we'll get there in order. We'll get there. I was confused. I'm sorry. That's quite okay. I don't mind at all. Um, and you have to keep Potiphar and Pharaoh separate because those two, starting with P's, it's easy no, to confuse no, no. the two. No, okay. Oh. Uh, it blows oh. Okay. Well, if you want it on low, go ahead. I got this on low. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you all need it there, like sure, this. you need it. No. Okay. Sorry, we had a little fan issue here in the house. <laughs> okay. So, who is Potiphar? He is this eunuch or this chamberlain. He is a right hand officer to the Pharaoh. He's also called the captain of the bodyguard or the captain of the guard, depending on your version. In Hebrew, it literally says he's the chief of the executioners. That means he probably was in control of the prison also, master over the prison. And look at chapter 40 and verse 3, because we're going to come into that rapidly here too. In 40 and verse 3, it says, So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Yosef was in prison. So we do see him having control uh, that this is all related. So Pharaoh's head, Potiphar's right there, like right under him with control, has control over probably other eunuchs, has control over the prison and, and those who ended up in prison. Now there's two different types of prisons too. There was different reasons for that. I'll bring that out later also. Mm. Potiphar bought him. Okay? Remember, Yosef is a picture of Yeshua Jesus. And as uh, Yosef became a servant in a different way, but so also Yeshua became a servant. He became a servant when he put on that human form and chose to come as a servant. We read this in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. You can put a marker in Philippians 2. If we get far enough, we're going to come back to this chapter a few different times. So... Um, write to these verses close by if you want to put a marker in there. Philippians 2 verse 6 says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, he being made in the likeness of man. So, Joseph became a slave. We see Yeshua Jesus became a slave, a servant. Okay? That's the 37th way in this chapter Oh, sorry, we're in the next chapter. So in the chapter prior, we had 36 ways Joseph and, and Yeshua Jesus are compared, but we're going on. Remember, there's many more than in that one chapter. I'm up to, I think it's number 60 now in my study. So it's, it's wow. This is only number 37. Now, Pharaoh in Egyptian means great house. It doesn't mean ruler, doesn't mean leader, that's what we all think, but when we get into it and we study it, ancient Egyptian rulers, pharaohs, were both the heads of the state and they were the religious leaders of the people. So the word pharaoh referred to the palace where they lived, the great house, rather than the, the title of being king, because we often think of it in that way. Okay, pharaoh, pharaoh means great house. house. So if they're a pharaoh, they're living in the great house. They're living in the palace. Okay, just to clarify. You'll see why later. We'll keep going. Verse 2, and I've got to go back to Genesis 39 myself. Verse 2, so we know who bought him now, is an Egyptian officer of the one who lives in the great house. 
he is the captain of the bodyguard. He bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. We saw that in the, the previous chapter when we were studying Yosef. So verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Now the Hebrew word for Lord here is Jehovah. This is the, the name that is the one who is faithful to his covenants. This is the name also that's the redemptive name of the deity of our God. So we're seeing in this the one who um, it, we're reading is with him is the one who's faithful to his covenant and the one who deals with redemption with mankind. Okay, so the Lord's with you. So he became a successful or a prosperous man, depending on your version, what word it says. There's number 38, the type of Yeshua Jesus also, because you cannot think of prosperous and successful as, oh, got a lot of money, live in a big house, drive a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce or, you know, wear, wear jewels and, and in that day, golden, uh, purple robes and all that. No, that's not what success is. I know, and I'm sure you also know, people who have earthly goods are poor. And yet we call them very successful because what matters is the success in their walk with the Lord, in their life with the Lord. And Yosef, we're going to see, is exemplary of this, that even when he is a slave and owns nothing, doesn't even own himself, yet God calls him prosperous. God calls him successful. With that in mind, we can see the comparison to Yeshahu, Isaiah 53. We're going to go all the way down to verse 10 in that chapter. And we know that whole chapter is a picture of the sacrifice lamb, Isaiah 53, sacrifice lamb. But going all the way down to verse 10, we read there, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. So in that one verse, we see that God was willing to, to allow Yeshua to become... Um, full of grief, to go through that suffering, the greatest being the sin sacrifice. When you look at the agony of Yeshua in the garden the night before the cross, I'm not going to say it wasn't a dreariness of the physical suffering that was going to happen. To some degree, I'm sure that was true. If you knew you were going to be crucified, you knew pain was coming. But the greater agony, what caused the great drops of blood of our Messiah and Savior, was knowing that that this sinless human slash God was going to take on sin, was going to, to literally become the sin offering. That's a better way than saying take on sin, but a holy God, we know that Yehovah the Father is not going to even look at this sin offering because that holiness and sin can't coincide. So for Yeshua to know that he was going to become the sin offering, that's what grieved his soul to the point that he, he was dripping sweat, uh, sweat drops of blood. That's the agony. And that's what's saying in this first verse is, Jehovah the Father was pleased to allow him to go into that grievous agony because it wasn't going to end there. There was a purpose for that. He had to go through that to shed his innocent, perfect, sinless blood in our place and in doing so, the rest of this verse, he will see his offspring. We are his offspring. We have, did we who have faith in Yeshua, Jesus are his children. We become children of the Lord when we receive him as salvation. You never see a grandchild. The Lord has no grandchildren. He has children. Always, every individual one has to come to him. So everyone who has named the name of Yeshua, Jesus as Savior, is the offspring of Yeshua. This is a great number that God had promised through this. This is who Yeshua would have. He would see his offspring. He would prolong his days because that human life came to that momentary end on the cross. But three days later, in resurrection life, abundant life, he would go on and he lives forever. And he lives forever mind-blowing, mind-boggling. He lives forever in that perfect human body. He didn't drop that part. He kept that part. They saw him raise from the dead. They saw him eat. They touched him. They saw the nail prints. They could put their hand in his side and feel where the, pierced, um, the arrow had pierced him. He still had his human recognition. He was who he was before, 
but now he had that human body that would not know decay, would not know suffering, would not know anything negative, none of the, uh, the, the effects of sin on it that goes on in through eternity. Do you realize the Lord in all his freedom chose to confine himself in a body and to know he was going to do that forever. Yeah. Not for 33 years. Forever. That's amazing grace. Yeah. That's wow. Wow. Now, having said that, don't let me take anything from him being fully God away from you either. He is not confined to one place. He can come through the walls. He can be anywhere he wants in an instant. He is still fully God. But he all of eternity will carry the nail prints. All through eternity, we can be reminded of the great cost of our salvation. Yeah. What it took for us to get there. Wow. If that's not love, what is? <clears throat> So, what, wow, what an example. <sighs> Breathe, Rochelle. <laughs> um, okay, so the Lord sees, Jehovah Lord God sees Yeshua as prosperous. His life wasn't cut short. It wasn't ended in, this is a defeat. Satan thought that. I think for three days, Satan thought he'd, he'd done it. He'd stopped Messiah. He got his heel, like Genesis 3.15 said. He would crush his heel. But when your heel is crushed, that's not the end. If you crush somebody's head, that's the end. That's the end. Read the rest of Genesis 3.15, <laughs> the first great prophecy, and he will crush your head. That's the end. Satan, for a time, is wreaking his havoc, but he knows his days are numbered. Why do you think he's trying so hard? Why is he trying right now again in our very day to write, wipe out the Jewish race? What's it matter? What's it matter? When it matters, if he can wipe out the Jewish race, then who does Messiah return to? Who does he set up as head nation? Who does he bless the rest of the world through? And who wants control of that world? Is Satan for good? Hello? No. <laughs> okay? And I could stop one letter short of that hello, but I don't talk like that, but you all get it. That's what he wants all over this earth. And he is bringing that onto this earth to degree that God will not allow him a totality, and he will not have a total victory. He will go down in the flames of defeat, and I choose those words on purpose, and we will all say, Amen. Hallelujah! Amen! Amen. <laughs> So, wow, what an example here we have in this. And forgive me if I'm on my soapbox, but that's, this is me. So you're stuck with me if you, if you come to my class. I love it. I just can't wait till my Savior gets to stomp on that head. He already has, but I mean where we see it. So, back in, in verse 2, Yosef was successful also because he was successful in the house. And that's what it says here. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. That's verse 2, okay? So in the house, he's brought in as a slave. But we're going to see that he quickly is brought up into a high position in the household. Let's just keep reading and we'll find out how that's true. Verse 3. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. Okay? How did his master know that? This master is Egyptian. I doubt seriously he's ever heard before the God of Israel. He doesn't know Yosef from anybody. He just knows he bought himself an able-bodied man. And he knew what he bought him for, to be his slave. But he sees that he's successful. And what do you think Yosef is doing? I believe he's telling him all about the God of Israel. I believe he lived his testimony and he spoke his testimony. I believe that he was already showing that character that was so great that he was saying, even though I'm sold off into slavery, did nothing to deserve this, shouldn't be in this position, I will shine for my Lord where I am. I will trust my Lord to release me in his perfect timing. I see a great character here. I see one who is being... Uh, exalting the name of his Lord no matter his circumstances and the Lord is blessing him for that so I believe that the master knew 
Well, this God of Yosef, because remember the Egyptians are very religious. They have all kinds. So they, they, I mean, they had the God of the flies, the God of the gnats, the God of the lice. You look. But, you know, if we, if we appease them, then they won't be bad to us. So this Potiphar is getting an upfront, first-hand example of who the true God, the one true and living God is, because the Lord was with him. And that's what verse 2 says, that the Lord was with Yosef, so he became a successful man. Okay, the Lord was with him. The Lord's hand was upon him and his finger was guard, guiding him. I'm going to say through the machinery of circumstances, God was at work. And what an encouragement to us. In the midst of our circumstances that we think are so bad, so negative, how could anything good come out of this? Just know the finger of God is on this. I'll give you the whole book of Esther. The whole book of Esther, you will not find God named. Not once. But if you don't see the fingerprint of God from start to end, a little Jewish girl in the middle of a Persian empire ends up queen? Really? Over all the Persians? You know, how did that happen if it wasn't the fingerprint of God? And I have to even laugh because in today's time, not that long ago, we have a time when there was a computer worm that got into the enemy of Israel's and I'll name them, into Iran's computer system with their nuclear, wreaked havoc, and set them back a number of years. There was a fingerprint in that, for those who are smart and know, not me, I just read the reports, <laughs> who know that kind of technology, it was called Stuxnet, if you want to go search, research it later. Nobody claimed responsibility, but in that, um, what it told Stuxnet what to do in, in the, in the oh, where's my vocabulary today? The code system. In, yeah, in the code system was an allusion to the book of Esther. <laughs> hmm, I just wonder what nationality those computer geniuses were who put this worm into the Iranian nuclear system that set it back for a number of years. Now, we know who did it above all, but the same way, the fingerprint the fingerprint. And now we go back to the fingerprint in Yosef's life. And we see that he is successful here because of his God. And so we find out that Potiphar was very pleased with him because it says, am I ready for verse 3? I am. Now, yeah, in fact, we've been reading it and how the Lord caused all that Yosef did to prosper in his hands. So he was very prosperous. The master's well pleased with him, and here again is the next way we see him a type of Yeshua Jesus. Because Yeshua Jesus, his Lord, God, Jehovah, was pleased with him. Let's read in Yochanan in John 8. John 8 and verses 29 and 30. John 8, 29 and 30. In Hebrew, Yochanan. Yochanan chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. 30. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I should have told you, Yeshua Jesus is speaking, okay? As he spoke these things, many came to believe in Yeshua. So Yeshua tells us himself that the one who sent him didn't leave him alone. He's always doing the things pleasing to his father. With that in mind, then let the words um, that you're very familiar with have even more meaning to them. Matthew, Mattathiah, chapter 3 and verse 17, where we read, and this is a time when Yeshua went through the waters of baptism, not as a picture of salvation. He had no sin to be buried and die from and resurrect in newness of life. But chapter 3 of Matthew, verse 17. But he went into the ceremonial ritual that the high priest had to go through before he could step into that priestly role. And Yeshua was stepping into his priestly ministry, so he went through the waters of, of the ritual to show himself as priest to his nation. And in this baptism, 
After being baptized in verse 16, Yeshua came up from the water, the heavens opened up, the Spirit of God, the Ruch HaKodesh, descending like a dove, lighting on him, and a voice out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Yosef and Yeshua both were well pleasing to the Father. And we repeat in Genesis 39, in verse 3 again, that everything prospered. I think, yeah, all he did was to prosper. Okay, and remember again in Isaiah, Yeshua, Yeshahu, Isaiah 53, verse 10, that we just read a bit ago, that God said that it would please him to bring him the offspring in his days to continue. So we see it um, in both ways. So, things must be going pretty good in that sense. He's still in slavery, but Yosef found himself, verse 4, uh, it, Yosef found favor in his sight, in his um, owner's sight, and he became his personal servant. He became the right-hand man for Potiphar. He's overseeing everything for him now. He made him overseer of his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge, or he put into his hand you might have. So his household affairs as well as his business affairs are now oversight by Yosef. He's controlling everything for Potiphar because Potiphar was so pleased with him. Um, okay, so where'd I go? Where'd I go? I lost my place. Okay, there we go. So he found favor. He found grace in his eyes. Um, they, that I pass it up in verse 4 also. And I think I told you everything else. Okay, so verse 5. Oh, overseer. Okay. Well, that means just everything was under his control. He oversaw it all. Okay. Um, verse 5, And it came about from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Yosef. Okay? Egypt is a type of the world. The world is and will be blessed by Messiah Yeshua Jesus. So in this way, we see number 40, the comparison of the two. Because Egypt even, or the world, was blessed through Yeshua's first coming because there'd be no salvation apart from Yeshua. And Egypt will come to blessing in the kingdom, in the millennial second coming of Yeshua Jesus also. So the world receives blessing because of Yosef at this time, because of Yeshua Jesus we see in the great comparison. So that's number 40. Now, it's also interesting, in these verses, we've had three times that it mentions that Potiphar is an Egyptian. And you would think, well, why do we need to do that? We're in Egypt. He's an Egyptian, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wrong, okay? Um, the reason why it's necessary is during this time of reign, from about 1700 to about 1550 B.C., we have the rule of the Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S. -S. Okay, that was the name, the, the Hyksos dynasty. You can, you can use the word dynasty. And they ruled Egypt, they ruled other areas, but they weren't originally Egyptians. Hyksos means a ruler from a foreign land. Okay, so they had come from elsewhere. They had settled in Egypt, they had raised into rulership, but they're the Hyksos that are ruling. So Potiphar was not an Egyptian, he was a Hyksos, and that's why three times we're being told that he, well, I say he's not Egyptian, he wasn't born Egyptian, but he came to be known as Egyptian because he comes into this rulership in the land of Egypt. Okay, so just showing you the, the specificity, specific how specific scripture is, that it gives us all the details accurately. So it's pointing out that the Hyksos ruler, was, you know, that, that's why it's saying that he was an Egyptian also, that he, he came into that citizenship, that he's ruler. Okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, everything in, in the Egyptian's house was blessed, and I counted Joseph, that's the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned, in the house and in the field. So his household's blessed, his, uh, his, um, I'm really fighting for words today, all his belongings are blessed. We'll just put it that way, okay? His, everything that he owns in the fields as well as in the home. 
So he left everything, verse 6, in charge, everything he owned in Yosef's charge. And with him, there he didn't concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. So Joseph's carte blanche. You got it, Yosef. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to watch over you. I'm not going to check you out. I so trust you. You're doing so great. Look at the way I'm being blessed. Have at it. I'm just going to get out of the way and let you go, is basically what he was saying. But Yosef was not responsible for the preparation of his food. Let me show you Genesis 43 and verse 32 real quick. Just a few chapters for you. Genesis 43 and verse 32. Genesis 43 and verse 32 we read. <clears throat> and let me tell you, this is when um, the his brothers have come into Egypt. And um, they know who he is now. Okay, so in verse 32... So they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. So Potiphar is willing to mix with Yosef, give Yosef carp lunch over everything he owns, over his whole household. But when it came to the meals, when it came to the food, uh-uh. You guys are yuck, and we're over here. So the Egyptians kept themselves separate. Joseph was kept separate, and Joseph wouldn't have been handling his food because to the Egyptian, that was contamination. Okay? Interesting. Interesting. We usually see and think of uh, the other way because we think of kosher, and we think of those staying away from it. And let me just throw in a little side note because I hear it so misunderstood. When God was working with Peter, Kepha, to realize that they were to go to the Gentiles now also. Yeshua is raised from the dead. The middle wall of partition is broken down. Jew and Gentile now can come alike to the Father. It's no longer that the Jew, has, I mean the Gentile has to proselyte into Judaism, stay under the law to come into right relationship with Jehovah. Now he can come through the shed blood of Yeshua. So that middle wall is gone and God is trying to reveal this change to Kepha. And he shows him in a dream these non-kosher animals. And he tells Kepha in the dream, kill and eat. And Kepha makes a great statement, which should show you this was not prejudice. This was him being a good, Jewish, obedient child. That's not kosher. I won't eat it. <laughs> God down the sheet three times because he's trying to help Peter see. Think differently now. You need to think in a new way. I'm doing something different. What I'm going to call clean, don't you call it unclean. I'm going to call the Gentiles who come to faith clean, just like the Jews. So it wasn't that I'm prejudiced and I want nothing to do with that Gentile. It was that Kepha was wanting to keep the law that he'd grown up with. He wanted to keep what he thought was right and pleasing to God. He wasn't coming against God. He was saying, no, I'm going to be a good Jewish boy. And God finally gets across to him by that third time, the knock on the door from a Gentile, you need to go to this house, you need to tell them about Yeshua, about salvation. And what Kepha sees happen, the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles the same way he did on the Jewish people on the day of Pentecost in that, that room. Wow. And that's what he and those who were with him go back and tell all the others who are the first believers, who are all Jewish, you're not going to believe it. It happened to the Gentiles just like it did to us. <laughs> That's what's going on. It's not a prejudice. It's having to see that God is now working in a new way. Mm -hmm. It's having to see that there's a change with the law. Because the law could not lead to salvation. Mm -hmm. It could only show the need for salvation. It's grace that brings in the salvation. So that's what's going on there. Here we've got a flip side though. We've got the Egyptians saying, look. You Jews, no, 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 you're not going to touch my food. <laughs> so, other than the food, that's all that, that, that Joseph was not responsible for. And it's interesting that archaeology even brings out the truth of the scripture. Because in sculptures and paintings of ancient Egyptian tombs, what they have found is the property of great men that they can tell from the hieroglyphics and all the drawings that there were scribes, as they called them, who exercised methodical, minute supervision over all the operations, over agriculture, over gardening, over the keeping of livestock, over the fishing, over everything. 
and they were carefully scrutinized. So as Potiphar had control from Pharaoh, he would have been scrutinized and he would have been following very carefully and that's what they were seeing. But here we've got something totally different. And that's why it's being brought out that Yosef was being separate from how the Egyptians would have been doing things. And probably because Yosef came in with knowledge. Remember, what did he do at home? Took care of the sheep. He knew how to take care of the fields. He knew good husbandry. He knew good ways to, to tend the flocks. And he probably shined, you know, let him shine. Because remember, the Egyptians were not shepherds either. That was considered abomination. So it was a whole different way. Yosef has this character that's showing he's not only upright and trustworthy, but he's knowledgeable too. So everything that had happened in his life was for his training, even for this position, even as what he's going through right now is training him for the next. Yep. If that isn't a lesson to us, what is? What you're going through now is to help you for what's coming down the road because the Lord knows what you're going to need to know, how you're going to need to develop so that you can be ready for what he's going to put you into. And that goes on and on and on until we're home with him. And then I believe it even goes on in a different way without the sin effect, but a different way through all of eternity because I don't believe that we're all, we're, we're going to keep learning and growing and knowing through eternity. We'll find out if I'm right or not, but I certainly think so. <laughs> So, he was in charge, we're back in chapter 39, we're at the end of verse 6, where I will read, I, oh, because I have read it all the way through. Um, okay, no I haven't, last no. phrase, sorry. My, my scripture broke it because the paragraph changed, so. <laughs> now Yosef was handsome in form and appearance, or he was goodly and well favored. Beautiful in form and appearance is what the Hebrew says. And it means, honestly, it means he had a beautiful face, okay? He must have been a very handsome young man. Um, we know that his mother, Rachel, Rachel, was unusually attractive also. Yaakov saw her in that way and was attracted to her. And apparently, Yosef's carrying that down. But I think even more than that, I think the demeanor that was shining was a godly, I think it, it radiated a sweetness. Uh, a godly character, that was even more appealing. I think that stood out in the crowd because this is now a heathen world. They're not going to be living lives that would reflect the godliness. So I think it made Yaakov really stand out. His testimony stand out all the more. He, today we'd say he was a clean-cut, good-looking kid who backed up by his actions what he looked like. That's what I think that we're seeing. And God's testimony of Yeshua Jesus was always that he was well favored. At his birth, the angels were saying, you know, the glories come down to earth. The earth should be celebrating. Then we already saw at his baptism how God responded. His testimony by uh, Yochanan, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he didn't look like a lamb. He looked like one who's standing out of the crowd though. That Yochanan also said, hey, I'm not even worthy of unlatching his shoe. He's a cut above. That's what Yosef was, and that's what Yeshua was. And then even the testimony at Yeshua's death, where the Roman centurion said, and this is recorded for us in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 54, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, how could he say that with this one so disfigured, so tortured, so horrendous in, a, in physical appearance, dying on a cross, how could he say he was the son of God? Because what did Yeshua do? Fight? Try to get away? No. Curse them? Bring the wrath of God down on him? We know he could have done anything to, to the perpetrators all the way up to the moment of his death. He could have at any moment changed that whole scene. But he didn't. He willingly went. Yeah. He submitted himself. He laid down his life. And as the, the centurion saw his actions... It spoke to him, wow, this one's not normal. This one is the Son of God. Yeah. The way Yosef is acting, wow, this is not the usual. This is not how a slave usually acts. I imagine the slaves look for ways to break free. I'm sure they had, you know, attitudes. I'm sure that there was a lot of this just, you know, wasn't glorifying the way Yosef came through. So what a difference and what a picture of our Messiah and our Savior. Verse 7, 
It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Yosef. Remember, he's a handsome young man, okay? And she said, lie with me. Okay, now, she obviously is lacking moral principles. Okay, just put it there. If her husband was a eunuch, maybe this is why she's tempted. You know, she's not satisfied. But again, did she marry into it politically? Did she marry into it for financial reasons? And then she just wasn't happy with her decision? Or did he get castrated during their marriage and now she's disappointed and left wanting? We don't know. But regardless, her moral standing lacks something to be desired, okay? And verses 7 through 12, she's going to sorely tempt um, Yosef. The same way that Satan came at Yeshua Jesus. We read it in, in Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Yeshua. After he gone through 40 days in the wilderness, his body is at the point of starvation. That's when Satan attacks him. Oh, you know, turn the, the stones into bread. You know, and he gets him on the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. I'll give you everything. Just bow down to me. You know, you don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to go through suffering. This has been bad enough. Let's, let's make a deal here. You know, he comes after him in that same way. And through Potiphar's wife, we're going to see that Yosef is sorely tempted. Not that he's wanting to, to submit, because I don't believe he did. But he's being tugged at and pulled at. Yeshua didn't want to submit to Satan either, but Satan didn't <clears throat> give up. He kept trying and he kept trying. The wife keeps trying and keeps trying. So, number 42, we see both of them sorely tempted, but they sin not. And that's, uh, again, Matthew 4, 1 through 11 for Yeshua. He was tempted according to the flesh um, and by Satan, the prince of the, the power of this world. And remember, again, we said Egypt is a type of the world, so we can draw that comparison. But we see, verse 8, Yosef's character comes through. He refused. He said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. He's put all that he owns in my charge. So he recognizes that he's been given a unique position of supervision. He's been given this authority because his master is respected who he is, his character. He's not about to, uh, to do something against his master. He says in verse 9, there's no one in the house greater, there's no one greater in this house than I. He's withheld nothing from me except you. Because you're his wife. So you're off limits. Apparently he even must have told Yosef he could have his way with the female slaves. You know, who knows what Potiphar held out to Yosef. It doesn't mean he did it. But he had, you know, all this freedom. It's just, just of course, not my wife. My wife is mine. So he says, how could I do this great evil and sin? He doesn't say against Potiphar, but sin against God. Because he knew that would be wrong before God. And that's... Um, where he was. He was not going to betray his master's trust. Um, even if no one else ever knew, he would know. God would know. He wasn't about to go there. Proverbs 15, verse 3. Proverbs 15 and verse 3. In Proverbs 15, verse 3, we read, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. That's a principle Yosef lived by. He wasn't good because he thought that, that you know, oh, I can, I can hide in here or not be good. No, he was good because he knew the eyes of the Lord were on him no matter what. He wanted to please his Lord, his master. Contrast that to the life of Judah that we read about in chapter 38, what we just came through. The one who yielded to temptation, the one who had his way with his daughter-in-law, not knowing it was his daughter-in-law, but thinking it's a temple prostitute. That was not honoring unto the Lord. So we see a total difference in character. And it's interesting that Judah, when he yields to that temptation, he's foreshadowing um, Adam. And Adam yielded to temptation. So we see that comparison. And Yosef, who doesn't yield to temptation, we again see the picture of the second Adam, Messiah, who was sinless. We read this in 1 Corinthians 15. We see that comparison there. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll start with verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 45, where we read, 
So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Mm -hmm. However, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is, is as and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we've been born in the image of the earthy, we also bear the image of the heavenly. We need to move into that second Adam. We need to move into Messiah, into Yeshua, Jesus. We need to give him control of our lives so that we can be the spiritual, which is a godly and right example and not live pleasing to our earthly, earthy self. So Yosef's a great great example of this in living action. He was not going to compromise. He was not going to uh, give in. You can imagine that there, there could have been a pull um, just because of his being human. But regardless of whether there was or not, he was not going to give in to it. So um, we're picking up in verse 10. As she spoke to Yosef day after day, can you imagine? She's, she's relentless. She's after him. She's constantly after him. She's not giving up. He did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. So verse uh, 11, Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. That gives me the idea that Yosef tried to keep himself from getting into a compromised position. He didn't go into the house except when the other men were there also, so he wouldn't be alone with just her. But something happened, whether he knew it and had to go in anyway, or whether he didn't realize, he got caught that far in that. So they're in the house alone, and she knows that she's going to take advantage of her situation. Verse 12, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And what does he do? She's got him by his, his coat that he's wearing. What does he do? I got to get out of here. He peels off his coat and he keeps right on going. He just leaves it in her hands because he's going to flee as quickly as he can. Our scripture says that um, he fled and went outside. So she probably thought she could force herself on him. And once she had, then he'd come the condies to it and, and she would um, have her way with him. She'd have whatever she wanted and she'd have it from that point forward but he was not taking he was not going to give in there was no matter what anything within his power he was going to use it so he literally had to peel himself out of what he was wearing and run out of the house whether it was shirtless now or or whether it was just an outer garment we don't know but he fled outside he he took off and he kept on going that's what we should do when sin comes to our door is we should flee that fast that we leave anything behind we have to. We don't let anything grab hold of us either. So, is she going to take this? Oh, goodness, almost said lying down. Not the right <laughs> way to say it. <laughs> Pardon the pun. But how is she going to take this? Verse 13 tells us, When she saw that he left his garment in her hand and it fled outside, she devises her plot. Okay, I've got him now. She scorned. She calls all the men of her household and she said to them, See he, now that he is not Yosef. When you read the whole sentence, you'll see she's talking about her husband. He has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. So she calls all the other slaves and maybe in there, there were those who were unhappy that this foreign slave who comes out of Israel, who isn't Egyptian even, <clears throat> that he got put up above them. Maybe they've been slaves for years with Potiphar. And they didn't get promoted. So this little whippersnapper comes out of nowhere and he gets that top position. There may have been a number who weren't real happy with Yosef, who didn't like him. But the thing is, is, is uh, Potiphar even realized he was being blessed. So that's why he elevated him up because he was being blessed. Absolutely. And I don't think he really, I believed her wife, that he had to go through in a way. Keep that peace. thought and let's see if it pans out. Yeah. <laughs> so... She calls these others that she probably thinks she can get camaraderie, you know, to her side. She calls them and she says, he's just brought this Hebrew in to make fun of us, to make mockery of us, to make sport of us. You know, he's going to show us up like he's better than we are. He came in to me to lie with me. He came in to have his way. She totally flips the story. 
this is 100% life and what happened. And I scream, oh, help, help, I scream. Yeah, right, excuse me, but. He's getting away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My table's saying, help, help, he's getting away. <laughs> wanting to trap him. So, again, no matter how they felt, whether they were jealous too, whatever, she's building her case. Now she's telling him, look, he came to do this, this horrible deed to me. This is what's happened. And I cried for help. And, of course, she's just, she's angry. She's scorned, like I said. And so um, she said, when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, then he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she's saying, oh, he knew he was going to get caught. So he just took off in a hurry. See, I've even got his coat because he was peeling off too. She's blaming everybody but herself? Yes. And even blaming her husband. Yes, she's even blaming her husband. And it's I'm his fault. some of those men probably knew that she was that way. I would and not be surprised. They're secretly probably thinking, oh, yeah, here she goes again. Yep, I would not be surprised. I think she yep. sent them out of the room. That's why, why they were there. Oh, I'm sure she got them out of the house. I'm sure she laid traps for him. Yeah. And that would be even why he went in is normally they were there then, and she'd sing yeah. to it, you go do this, you go do that, you know, whatever. She laid her trap. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, but, uh, her husband punished her somehow. I wish we could find that out. Well, you might find out one day. It's certainly mm -hmm. not given to us, so we don't know. But <laughs> um, So verse 18, she raised her voice, she screamed, and because of that, he laughed and he fled. So we're into verse 19. Okay, so it, it's been, oh, and by the way, that's the 43rd way that Yosef and Yeshua are the same. They both were falsely accused. In Matthew 26, in fact, I'll read it for you real quick. Matthew 26, 59 and 60 we'll see Yeshua falsely accused. You know it goes on. It's not just one time, but through the whole night of trials that he goes through, they finally get the liars to come lie and, and say that he had done things he had not done. In 59 and 60 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, we read, Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Yeshua that they might put him to death. They didn't find any, even though many false witnesses came forward, but later on, two came forward. So there are many who tried to bring false accusations that would fall by the wayside, but finally they found two who managed somehow to get their words to stick and to hold weight, just like her words. Even though they're not true, they're, they're going to hold weight. Yosef is going to suffer the consequence of her words, even though they're not true. Yeshua is going to suffer the consequence of those false liars, even though none of it was true. Was well, that uh, chapter 29 in Matthew? 26. Six, it's in your, yeah, in your cross-references, verses 59 and 60 of Matthew 26. Okay? Now, the garment would incriminate her if she didn't accuse Yosef. Why does she have his garment? She had the to, to make a scheme out of it. She had to say something. Um, okay, I'll help you find it later, Loretta, because it should be. Yeah, yeah we're, un, we're under verse 15. You don't have it 85, then that's your problem. <laughs> okay, and I've got 84 and I've got 87 here. I'll get you the pages in between later. Okay, sorry. I usually I come down with extras, but I didn't. Okay, so just know if I give any, if I go off with scripture that the Lord puts in my mind, I'll make sure I'll say this is not in your cross references. Okay. <laughs> okay. You gave me 84, and then you gave me uh, um, um, 87. I go, wait a minute, was 85? Okay. So I passed out 85 and 86 when you weren't here, and usually I do for a couple of weeks. So somehow I missed. My apologies. But, and the rest of you, by the way, you're in your emails. If I email you, it's all the way through. Good. Rowena got them. The rest of you have them, too. And I apologize. It was last minute. Finally, I'm learning my computer system. And Roger gave me a quick course. And I had to scan them in this morning. And I sent them off in a hurry. <laughs> so my apologies. But anyway, since she realized she couldn't get Yosef to sin with her, She's going to humiliate him. She's going to do everything possible, bring him down, and of course make herself look good because she's she'd have a problem with her husband otherwise, I think. You know. 
But isn't it interesting that this is the second time Joseph's robe is being used for a false report. The first time comes to the father, bloodied by a goat, is this your, your son's, he was killed by a wild animal, now it's going to hold against him also. Just an interesting little He's side note there. Taking those coats. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know this was anything special, <laughs> but uh, well, when maybe. Jesus garment was divided too. Yes, and that's where I was headed. Yes, uh, that, that. I don't think her husband will believe. Uh, he knows his wife pretty well. Well, right? let's see what he does, okay? Because he hears. I read it. Verse 19. See. Ron's on your wavelength, Loretta, and he's giving the answer, <laughs> okay? And I agree with you 100%, okay? When the master heard the words of his wife, and I love the enthusiasm, by the way, verse 19, when the, the husband, when the master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. Now, it doesn't say his anger burned at Yosef. He got angry. You're at it again. You want to have an affair with one of my slaves, you know. And, and I mean, we don't know where his anger burned. We just know it made him mad, okay? So, Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. Now, let's understand a little bit about this, okay? He had it in his power to put Joseph to death. He didn't. No. Number one, for saying, hmm, did he know Yosef was an innocent man? I have a feeling he did. And he knew Yosef was not deserving of death. So he has that ability. He's not going to put him to death. But he's also caught in his wife's vice. He can't question her in front of all the slaves and in front of all of Egypt and put her down as his wife and she's in a position too. And he probably also knows I'll be the next one that's scorned by her. Who knows what she'll do to me? So he's in a quandary. He's in a stuck position and he looks for a middle road answer. Well, can I so, ask a question? If, if, I think he's over her as a husband, as authority with, the, with the, the king, how would she be ruled over? Because unless he was willing to put her to death, he's going to have to live with her. So he, he must have, in spite of how she was, there must have been a love there for her. He didn't want to get rid of her as his wife. He didn't want to make her, the Egyptian, look bad and a slave who's not Egyptian look good, who knows what all is going through his mind, you know. But for whatever reason, he's, he's not going to kill her off, which, yes, he's, he's got the authority, or put her down or subdue her or whatever, but at the same time, he's not going to take it as far against Yosef as he could have. And putting him in the king's prison was not where the criminals went. It was where the political prisoners went. So he's not putting him into as bad of a dungeon as what he could have. Well, I think in private, I bet he let her have it. In private, he may have, and in private, he may have even told Yosef, because there is a hint in that, that since he had control over that, that he might have hoped, give me time, let me figure a way out of this, I'll get you out of here. Now, he doesn't, but he might have had that good intention. He might have wanted to, and he might have even shared that with Yosef. We don't know. This is where we're reading between the lines, and we don't know. But this prison house, it would have been a round ten tower or a dungeon, and again, where the political prisoners that were connected to the official life, where they were held. And the captain of the guard is over both. That's why, remember, he, he was called the, the chief of the executioners. He can call for death. They can also just call for imprisonment. And that's all he did was yo with Yosef was call for imprisonment. And I would think since Yosef has caused his whole household to succeed, he knows it, he saw that, he saw that he's gained. I think he's probably thinking in his mind, I want him back as fast as I can. Let me put you aside, but figure my way to get you out of here and get you back into my household. So who knows what kind of political power she had? Mm -hmm. Who knows her background, where she came from, who he would upset if he took her life? You know, it could have been that their marriage was an arranged marriage and, you know, his hands were a little more tied than when we know. We don't know. Like I said, we can ask one day if we care when we get there. 
if he's in heaven, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> well, if he isn't, Yosef is, and Yosef can tell you. <laughs> and the Lord can certainly tell you, because nothing is hidden from the Lord. But remember in, in Tehillim, in Psalm 105, in verse 18, we read 16 to 22 earlier. Verse 18, it said that he would be in prison, that he would be confined. Here's the fulfillment, or actually, because David writes it later, here's David historically writing accurately that this is what happened to him. And when it happened, we do not see Yosef defend himself. We don't read of that at all. In the same way, Yeshua didn't defend himself. When the charges against him were wrong, he did not say, hey, well, wait a minute, put me on trial, let me get my people, you know, none of this is true. He didn't defend himself, he went quietly as a sheep go to the slaughter. Isaiah 53 and verse 7 this time. And I read for you, Yeshahu, Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Tehillim Psalm uh, 106 said that Joseph would be afflicted. Okay, same word. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. This is number 44, in the way Yosef and Yeshua are being compared. And then 45, right tied together on it, the innocent one is sentenced and will suffer, and understand why I'm phrasing it this way, he'll suffer at the hands of the Gentiles. I'm saying that because right now we see Yosef at the hands of the Egyptians, not at the hand of his brethren, suffering. And Yeshua suffered in a Gentile world that brought his crucifixion. I bring that out because it was Roman crucifixion. I make it very clear. One, Yeshua laid down his life willingly. No one took it from him. Two, our sins put him on that cross. Three, those sins were Roman sins. They were Jewish sins. They were whatever nationality you want to put in there. We are all guilty. But there is so much rhetoric, and especially today, in a world of anti-Semitism, this is rising again also. The Jews are the Christ killers. The Jews deserve whatever they get. They're cut off from God. There's no blessing to them, and it goes on and on. And so I make it very clear. Here we have the world of the Gentiles being the example of what happened. It's not that I'm picking on the Gentiles. Yes, Jewish sin was a cause for Messiah's death. Gentile sin was a cause for Messiah's death. I'm just making that you know very clear. Um, and if we weren't living in the world we were living in, I probably wouldn't even feel as much the need to say it. But do I hear that here in America? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I hear it in San Bernardino? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I hear it in, quote, churches that are supposed to be good churches? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sadly, I do. And they don't realize what they're opening to. So, forgive me, I'm on my soapbox again. <laughs> okay? Um, now, again, probably in the world they were in, too, and there was no chance for Yosef as a servant to come against the word of a Potiphar, a, 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 a ruler's wife. There's just no way. It was not going to happen. But if he had agreed to it, he would have dealt differently. Look at Pilate. Pilate didn't believe the accusations. He washed his hands of it. He wasn't willing to walk away and do nothing. He allowed it to happen. And I'll say in that same way, we've got another comparison because Potiphar walks away and lets happen, lets Yosef go into um, a suffering situation for it, even though he didn't believe it. Pilate also, even though he didn't believe it, he didn't oh, yeah. put a stop to it. Um, That's pretty typical in political positions. The person wants to make sure their position is protected. They don't want to do anything that's going to... Good point. Good point. Good point. Yes. Yes. And I think that's very much. Um, they don't want to rock the boat. Right. <laughs> that exactly where I was going. You just said it. Didn't want to rock the boat. It didn't want the fallout to come on them in any way. They're they're going to keep safe face and keep it and moving forward. First Peter, First Kepha, chapter two, and verse nineteen says. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. You know that that's not right. You know it's coming against you wrong. But for the name of the Lord, you're going to be willing to suffer that. 
uh, lost my place. For what credit is there if when you sin you're harshly treated and you endure that with patience, but when you do right and you suffer for it patiently enduring it, that finds favor with God. So even if you have that happen in your circumstances today, you take that high road the same way Yosef did, the same way we see him picturing us Yeshua, that finds great favor with God. And give God time. He's the great exonerator. He's the one that rights the wrongs. He's the one that deals justly and fairly. And for all that think they've gotten away with it, there is a day of reckoning coming. Unless they find forgiveness for their sin, excuse me, before. And then, then when they do, they usually make restitution themselves. Verse 21. What time are we? Let's see where we want to conclude. Okay, maybe we can get to the end of our chapter real quick. I think we can. So I'll try to hurry, and if it's too fast, I'll bring it back next week also. Verse 21. Did I do 20? Yes, you did 21. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Confined in the King's Jail, I did. Okay. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Yosef. I love it. Mm -hmm. He's been thrown into the pit now. He's in the dungeon. He's gone from bad to worse. He's not just a slave now. He's a prisoner now. But the Lord was with him. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. It's the last part of Hebrews 13, 5. Okay, so the Lord was with Yosef. He extended kindness to him, gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Does this not reflect Yosef's character too? Wherever he went, he finds favor with those who are around him. Whatever situation he found himself in, he found a way to honor the Lord, and the Lord blessed him with that favor around the others. So he, just like he won the respect of Potiphar, He's won the respect of the warden over this prison here also. And again, I would liken that to that centurion that we talked about a few moments ago. I would say this is number 46, a type of Yeshua Jesus being honored by the words of the centurion. He's got to be the son of God. In that same way, I see Joseph honoring the Lord and his warden saying, there's something different about this one. Is it possible that uh, a part of the still would be blessed even though he put it into the good side of the prison? Would he still be blessed? Well, his is not going to see the bless the blessing that happened at Joseph's hands because it was everything that Joseph was putting his hands to that was prospering. Mm -hmm. Now his hands aren't going to be there working. So I think he's going to see a lack in his household, but at the same time, because he didn't come against Joseph and kill him, God may have extended some grace to Potiphar, you know, mm -hmm. realize that uh, um, well, God doesn't realize anything. I mean, even that word as fast as I say it. But act in accordance with the fact that Potiphar was caught in a hard spot. But, like Ron said, if he's appeasing his friends, his peers, rather than pleasing God, then they'll withhold grace and all from the Lord. You have to remember, we don't read anywhere that Potiphar came to believe in the God of Israel. He just saw the difference, saw the results. So... Who knows? I would love to find out he did come to believe because I want everyone to be in heaven one day. So real fast to end, he gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Um, I have a note here, verse 22. The chief jailer committed to Joseph uh, charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. Same thing's happening here. He was in the household of Potiphar over all the slaves. Now he's with the prisoners. He's head over all of the prisoners. So that whatever he was, whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. Okay, or the doer of it, if you have the old King James, but that's what it means. Yosef's in a position of responsibility now over the other prisoners. Very key, very important for our next chapter. And our last verse, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Yosef's charge the same way Potiphar didn't. They're not looking over him. They're not macromanaging or micromanaging. They're leaving him alone. You have at it. You're doing great. You're responsible. I'm not going to worry about it. And they did that because the Lord was with Yosef. So the Lord caused them to have this favor on Yosef. And whatever he did in prison, the Lord made to prosper. Can you prosper in a prison with the yeah. Lord? Yes. yes. Can you prosper in a household as a slave? Yeah. Yes. Whatever circumstance you're in, have your heart so right before the Lord. Act in that godly character and you will see the blessing of the Lord surround you also. Beautiful, beautiful lesson for us. I'll give you next week, because I don't want to rush through it, I'll give you that we have... The name Jehovah that I've presented to you, 
But we have another time in this chapter where the name Elohim is used instead of the name Yehovah. I'll point you out the difference, and we'll talk about why. But that way, you'll want to come back next week. <laughs> so, and then we'll go into chapter 40 because it's key. Yosef had to be where he is for chapter 40 to happen. Chapter 40 is key because if it didn't happen, how would Yosef ever get to the position of just under Pharaoh? So, is God's hand moving? Oh, yes. Is God blessing him? Yes. Is Yosef a blessed man? The question I put out today? Yes. Whether he's a slave or whether he's a prisoner, he is still a blessed man. And may God bless you the same wherever you find yourself in your life. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you. We praise you. You are holy and you are in, in control, complete control. And you do bless. And we are so undeserving of it, but so thankful for it. May your showers of blessings, of grace, and of mercy continue to fall as you say, great is your faithfulness, and that your mercies are new every morning. So we thank you because we need that in our lives, and may we live godly characters that you might be able to bless us in the way you blessed Joseph. Thank you for the example that he is to us, because we know he was not fully God, and yet we see in him that godly character. Oh Lord, let it be so in us even from the very moment we go out the door, out of this class, and continue on. Wherever and everywhere, let us shine for you. And we do it by the power of your real Chakotish, not by ourselves. So we praise you and thank you for empowering us, strengthening us, guiding us, leading us, holding us, keeping us, and blessing us. Wow, what a God. Hallelujah. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.